few months ago, I made a video on cold cases that were solved years later, and you guys really seemed to like it. Most of the cases on that list went at least a decade before being solved, but some cases only grow cold for a few years before the truth finally comes out. Our next story went unsolved for four years and is especially brutal. One of the more brutal cases I've covered, so be forewarned. But I think it's an important story to tell for so many reasons. This is the story of Erica Green. Erica Michelle Marie Green was born on May 15, 1997, in McLeod, Oklahoma. Her mother, Michelle Pierce, had been in prison for just over a month for larceny, though some sources said forgery. Erica was the youngest of five children Michelle had with Larry Green. She had three other children, but I couldn't determine paternity for any of them. The Mabel Bassett Correctional Center didn't allow inmates' children to live with them, so Michelle had to find a guardian for Erica. She chose Betty Brown, a friend of her grandmother's. In order to take Erica home with her, Betty Brown filled out a one-page form and showed prison officials her driver's license and Sam's Club card. There was no background check ever performed. Erica was raised in Oklahoma, mostly by Betty, who said that Erica was one of the most independent children she had ever met. On April 4, 2001, Michelle picked up three-year-old Erica and said she wanted to take her to a family reunion. Michelle and her then boyfriend, Harrell Johnson, who she would marry the following year, took Erica and one of Harrell's children to Kansas City, Missouri, where they moved in with one of Harrell's cousins. Michelle had been in the area to look for a job, but ended up getting into drugs and Betty Brown would never see Erica again. On the evening of April 28, 2001, police in Kansas City were searching for a missing elderly man when they stumbled on something else. The naked, decapitated body of a young child was found in a wooded area in the city, close to a church. The child's head was found three days later by a volunteer searcher in a plastic bag about 100 yards away from the body. The body was of a black female, initially estimated to be between three and six years old. Because of the child's age and the brutality of the crime, the case quickly gained national attention. But despite this, nobody actually came forward to claim the body of the girl, who had been dubbed Precious Doe. No children fitting her description had been reported missing in the area, and there were no witnesses to the murder or disposal of the body. Due to her age, investigators were stunned that Precious Doe hadn't been reported missing. But in the absence of anyone else claiming her, the public stepped up. Volunteers helped spread the word about the case via radio, newspapers, flyers, and knocking on doors. They also raised money for Precious Doe's funeral, which was held in December 2001 and attended by hundreds of people. And they raised money for a memorial to Precious Doe in Hibbs Park, close to where her body had been found. And investigators were hard at work, too. After the body was found, police released a composite sketch and were able to narrow down her age to between three and four years old. In 2002, Precious Doe's body was exhumed so an autopsy could be conducted. The body was exhumed again in 2003, so investigators could study the likeness of her skull and create a new bust showing what she may have looked like. The case was featured on multiple TV shows like America's Most Wanted and Cold Case Files. Police received over a thousand tips concerning the case, some from as far away as Jamaica. But for four long years, all their efforts ultimately led to dead ends. Perhaps one of the most vocal activists for Precious Doe was Alonzo Washington. He raised $33,000 for reward money in the case and even released a comic book about it. Every year on the anniversary of Precious Doe's body being found, he put out an ad in a local African-American newspaper called the Kansas City Call sometimes shortened to the call. These ads urged anyone with information to come forward, and it was one of them that ended up breaking the case wide open. On April 30th, 2005, Alonzo received a tip from a call subscriber named Thurman McIntosh, who claimed to be the grandfather of Harrell Johnson. Harrell lived in Muskogee, Oklahoma, but had been in Kansas City in the spring of 2001 with his wife, Michelle, one of his children, and Michelle's three-year-old daughter, Erica Green. The Johnsons eventually returned to Oklahoma, but Erica wasn't with them. Michelle had always told questioning friends and relatives that Erica was with someone else, but Thurman McIntosh believed Erica might actually be Precious Doe. 
Alonzo forwarded the tip to a Kansas City homicide detective, and Thurman was brought in for questioning on May 4th. He was able to provide investigators with photographs of a girl he claimed was Erica, as well as hair from Michelle Johnson. The photos actually turned out to be one of Erica's cousins, but the DNA from the hair was a match to Precious Doe. The Johnsons were brought in for questioning that same day, and between the two of them, the full story came out pretty quickly. In late April 2001, the Johnsons were living in Kansas City with Harrell's cousin. Also living with them was Harrell's child, six-month-old Markeisha Johnson, and three-year-old Erica Green. One night, Harrell grew frustrated with Erica because she didn't want to go to bed. He was already drunk, which could have contributed to his frustration. He was also high on PCP at the time. I knew pretty much nothing about PCP before making this video, but apparently in high doses it can cause delusions, disordered thinking, and detachment from reality. Some of these things might at least partially explain what happened next. With Michelle close by, an angry Harrell began kicking Erica. I'm not sure exactly how many times he kicked her, but at least one kick connected with her head, which knocked her unconscious. When Michelle realized what had happened, she was horrified. But both of them had outstanding warrants for their arrest, so they didn't want to seek medical attention for Erica. Michelle tried to revive Erica by putting her in a bathtub of cold water, but it didn't work. Erica never woke up, and it's estimated that she was unconscious between 10 hours and 2 days before she died. After Erica's death, the couple hid her body in a baby stroller. Armed with a pair of hedge clippers, they took her body to the wooded area where it was eventually found. They took her clothes off, and Harrell cut her head off with the hedge clippers in an attempt to hide her identity. They initially put her head in the dumpster of the nearby church, but Michelle was afraid that people at the church would smell it, so they took it out and put it in the wooded area. The next day, when Harrell's cousin asked where Erica was, Michelle told her that Betty Brown, who had raised Erica, had come and taken her back to Oklahoma. Over the next four years, she told similar lies to Erica's siblings, as well as Larry Green. Sometimes she would refuse to talk about Erica at all, but nobody reported her missing because they simply thought she was somewhere else. On May 5, 2005, it was announced that Precious Doe was Erica Green and that the Johnsons had both been charged with second-degree felony murder. Both in jail at the time on unrelated charges, they were extradited to Kansas City. While in jail awaiting trial, Harrell wrote letters to Michelle, urging her to change her story and to pin Erica's murder on someone else. But in September 2007, Michelle pled guilty to the second-degree murder charge and decided to testify against Harrell. She was eventually sentenced to 25 years in prison, 15 for murder, and 10 for endangering the welfare of a child, abandoning a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence. After learning Michelle planned to testify against him, Harrell's tone changed. He told Michelle he hoped she got ran over, though I'm not sure if he meant that literally or metaphorically. He also said she was no better than him and would often abandon Erica for hours at a time while she did drugs. After the Johnsons were arrested, a Kansas City police officer said that Harrell's charges might be bumped to first-degree murder if a grand jury could prove premeditation. I'm assuming they did at some point because when Harrell's trial began in October 2008, that's what he was charged with. In addition to the Johnsons' confessions and Michelle's testimony, there was physical evidence. Erica's autopsy report was consistent with the injuries Harrell claimed to have given her. It also listed her cause of death as a closed head injury, which is usually caused by the head hitting an object or vice versa. A neurosurgeon testified that if Erica had gotten medical attention right away, she probably would have survived. Between all of these things, Harrell Johnson's fate was sealed. It took just a few days for the jury to find him guilty of first-degree murder, endangering the welfare of a child, and abusing a child. In November 2008, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Harrell later appealed his conviction. According to his and Michelle's testimony, Erica's death had been in the heat of the moment and not premeditated, a requirement for first-degree murder. But the appeal was denied because of his willful and deliberate decision not to seek medical treatment for Erica, which probably would have saved her. In 2010, Erica's biological father, Larry Green, filed a lawsuit against the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. According to the lawsuit, they should have monitored Erica more after she was born and had better procedures in place to determine who got custody of her. It also said the Department of Corrections should contact the Oklahoma Department of Human Services when an inmate gave birth. 
so the child could be better cared for. The lawsuit was settled in 2013. The DHS, DOC, and University of Oklahoma Medical Center, where Erica was born, agreed to adopt new procedures to ensure the babies born to mothers in prison will be referred to DHS to plan for the safe placement of the newborn before the baby leaves the hospital. An undisclosed amount of monetary compensation was also awarded to Larry Green, and the DHS said they would collectively refer to these new policies as Erica's Rule. On May 15, 2017, community activists gathered at Erica's new grave to have a party for her on what would have been her 20th birthday. At the party, activists handed out flyers for groups like Mama on a Mission, Mothers in Charge, and Corey's Network, all dedicated to advocating for victims of violence and their families. This is everything I have on this case up to the present day. I am very curious to hear your thoughts in the comments. Out of all the cases I've covered so far, with the exception of Kaylee Anthony, this is probably the one that's affected me the most, and I'm sure you guys have a lot of thoughts on the subject as well. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it, and if you enjoy my other videos, I hope you'll consider subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.